So I'll try to explain you um, some uh, result, but trying um, mostly to present what, uh, what we are trying to do. So essentially this starts from uh, statistical mechanics in which um, you want to describe the evolution of a gas. So you have these uh, molecules which are evolving. Uh, they say satisfy the Newton's equation and you can you want to derive maybe the Euler or the Navier-Stokes equation for the evolution of the density of these gases. So you want to start from a microscopic dynamics, from a microscopic description of the evolution of your gas, and derive from that the macroscopic evolution of the conserved quantities of your gas, maybe the energy, the density of particles, and so on. Well, as stated, well, this problem has not been solved. It's uh, very difficult, but what uh, people have been doing in the last 30 years is well, to assume that the dynamics, it's not uh, deterministic, but it's stochastic. And then, using some ergodicity of your model, you can derive um, the evolution of the conserved quantities of this model. So let me introduce you a model, which is a reaction diffusion model. So we'll take, uh, to fix ideas, a one-dimensional torus, though everything I will say works in any dimension in an infinite volume. And we will fix some exclusion rules. So you'll have particles evolving on this one-dimensional torus. So you fix n, you divide your torus on small intervals of size one over n. You place particles. And um, these particles will, have, will satisfy an exclusion rule. So you have at most one particle at each side. And these particles will evolve according to some stochastic dynamics. So just to fix notation, uh, eta will represent the configuration. So eta x will be either 0, 1 if site x is empty or it's occupied by a particle. Okay. And uh, to the model, we'll have two different types of dynamics. The first one, we will exchange very fast uh, neighbor sites. So at each bond, you will exchange at a rate which has been speed up by n square what happens in uh, the bonds. So if you have a particle and an empty side, you just exchange them at rate n square, and you do that at each bond. So you have a very fast exchange of uh, particles. And uh, you superpose to that. So this dynamics, of course, it's a conservative one. So the total number of particles, it's conserved. And you will superpose to that one which is non-conservative one. Um, so you fix a function c. You can take uh, c, say, equal to 1, for instance. But you can also c will depend on finite number of sites. So it can be equal to 1 if there is a particle at that site. At the origin, it can be 2 if there is no particle there. So just a strictly positive function, which depends locally on your configuration. And with that rate, which depends on the uh, configuration, you will flip the, um, the site at x. So if there is no particle at x, you will create one at that rate. And if there is a particle, you'll just remove that particle from uh, your system. So this one, it's a non-conservative one, but it's not, it has not been speed up by uh, n square. Okay, so you, this is the stochastic dynamics that you're considering. And why, so what we want to do first is to derive the uh, macroscopic evolution of the system. Say that if you, what happened, so you have here your one dimensional torus, zero, one. Say that at time zero, you start with a configuration in which all sites from zero up to some point x are occupied and all sites from x to one are empty. So now let your process evolve. And you want to, so let me call that uh, row zero, this initial density profile, which is as I, the one I proposed, which is one from zero to x, y. So let now the process evolve. And what you'd like to do is to prove that at a later time t, what you'll find, it's a new density profile. And this density profile, will evolve according to some PD. So it's the, essentially, uh, the goal is to uh, obtain the PD which describes the evolution of the density, which is the 
conserved quantity for this system. Okay, so this is the goal, one of the first goals. So what will be uh, very important here is that you, you speed up the conservative dynamics. So what you expect at any time is that if you look at one point of your system, so let's say that you fix here point Z, and you look at a small neighborhood around this point Z. So since uh, the conservative dynamics has been speed up, what you expect is that to find in this neighborhood a distribution of particles, so a state, which is very close to the state, to the stationary state of the uh, conservative dynamics. So the conservative dynamics, um, which I'm calling here the steering dynamics, has a very simple stationary states. So the stationary states are just product measures with certain density rho. So if you fix a density rho between 0 and 1, and if at each site you place a particle with probability rho and you leave that site empty with probability 1 minus rho, you obtain a measure on the configuration space. And what I'm saying is that this measure, it's uh, stationary for that dynamics. So from that, and this will be very important in um, the deviation of the PD, you expect that locally around each point, you observe a certain state. And this state will be very close to the stationary state of the steering dynamics, which is a Bernoulli product measure. But now the density here may depend on the point at which you're looking at. Okay. So this is the idea of local equilibrium, which is fundamental in this, um, in this field. So that locally, what you observe, it's something very close to a stationary state of the, of the dynamics. But now you have the stationary states are indexed by one parameter, because you have one conserved quantity, which is here the density. So for each density, you have a different stationary state. And this um, local equilibrium may have a density which is uh, space dependent. Okay. So, the, okay. so the first result I, I want to mention here is what's obtained in the 80s by uh, Demasi, Ferrari, and Leibovitz. So they proved exactly what uh, I presented there. They proved that if you, so let me represent by pi n a measure. So I will place, uh, this is a Dirac measure at site x in these discrete torus. So I'll place a Dirac measure at site x with weight 1 over n if there is a particle. So in this way, I go from a configuration to a measure on these uh, one-dimensional torus. And this measure, it's um, a random measure. So what they proved is that if uh, this random measure is converging to some measure which is deterministic and has some density with respect to the Lebesgue measure, which is rho naught, then at any later time t, the measure will converge to a new uh, density profile, which is the solution of this reaction diffusion equation. Okay? So this describes how uh, your empirical measure is evolving in time. Your empirical measure will just follow um, this uh, reaction diffusion equation, and I will introduce uh, this function f in the next slide. Okay. So this is um, why this model has been introduced. And my problem is the following. Um, well, this is a stochastic dynamics. It's, uh, in fact, an example of a finite state Markov chain. This finite state Markov chain is irreducible. It has a unique stationary state. So which means that if you let your process evolve for a very, very long time, particles will uh, reach some uh, stationary state. This stationary state, it's not explicitly known. Right? So as I said, if you take only the steering dynamics, you know explicitly what is the, st the stationary state. These are the Bernoulli measures. Well, for this one, you don't know. You don't have an explicit formula for that stationary state. And I would like to understand that stationary state. So to see, um, well, in which density profiles this stationary state will be concentrated. Okay, so let me try to make that uh, more precise. Um, well, first let me try to explain why uh, the reaction diffusion equation describes the evolution of your system. 
and let me define that function f which is appearing in the uh, PDE. So let me represent the density at time t at a point x by rho tx. So this is the expected value of the number of particles you have at x at time t. So if you want to investigate the evolution, the occupation of a site may, well, will change due to two different uh, types of dynamics. The first one is the one that you exchange. And this uh, exchange, which has been speed up, will provide you, will give you a discrete uh, Laplacian. So maybe let me not uh, enter into the details here. Let me explain a bit, bit more um, the reaction term. So in the occupation variable may change if you have an empty site and this empty site gets occupied. So to have an empty site, uh, here is the rate at which, well, it's the imposition that you have an empty site at x at time t. And then you exchange, so you will create a particle there at this rate. So this is the rate at which you create a particle at site x. And this is the rate at which you destroy a particle at site x. You need to have a particle there, and there is a jump rate. Well, the local equilibrium tells you that uh, around x, you should find at any time a state which is very close to the Bernoulli product state. So let me define B as the expectation of this rate when uh, the density is rho, when you have a state which is the Bernoulli measure with density rho. And in the same way, let me denote it by D, the rate at which you destroy a particle when the state is a Bernoulli product measure with density rho. So the function f will be just, so here we expect something to be the density. You don't know the density, so let us represent the density by rho t x. So what you expect that is that this expectation, you can replace it by the expectation of the Bernoulli, but taking the density rho t x. So if you compute the expectation of this object when you have rho t x, what you get, it's exactly uh, B of rho t x minus D, which explains this reaction term. Okay. Anyway, um, this is a rough description of why we get this equation as the evolution of your um, density profile in time. Okay. So let's uh, assume that you accept that. Let me take, um, let me represent this function f as uh, minus a potential. Let me, uh, I will mainly consider here double well potentials. So here's a double well potential. This is v, and f will be uh, minus v prime. So what uh, I want to, to see is that, well, assume that this is your potential v. Take the stationary state. What are the, um, so, okay, let me go back a bit. So let's see uh, how the, this density profile evolves. So if you start with a uh, row which is constant in space, so the Laplacian will be uh, equal to zero and you will evolve according only to the reaction term. So if you start here, your density is uh, negative, so it's with minus sides it's positive, so you, in fact you will relax to this uh, stable point. The same thing will happen here, and here you have an unstable equilibrium point. So, uh, what you expect is that when n becomes very large, your density profile evolves according to this reaction diffusion equation, and as time goes to infinity, the solutions will converge to the stationary solutions of this equation. Well, what are the stationary solutions of this equation? I just point out that there are at least, uh, in this example, three stationary solutions which are constant equal to that value, constant equal to this value and that value. These two are stable, this one is unstable. But in fact, there are many more. So let me give you an example of the uh, Chaffee-Infant equation. So Chaffee-Infant equation uh, will is this reaction diffusion equation in which the potential V is given by this expression. You see that this expression is symmetric 
around one half. And well, it has two, as in this picture, two minima and one um, saddle point at exactly one half. Uh, it has been proved and in the beginning of uh, 2000 that all the uh, solutions of these equations are the following ones. So you have, let me represent by rho minus this density, by rho plus this density, here's one half. So you have these three constant solutions, but there are many more, which are periodic ones. Which are these periodics? Well, take, so here A, it's a parameter, take an integer m, such that m square, it's bounded by 2a by, divided by pi square. For, for each m satisfying these inequalities, you have a stationary solution which has m periods. And these are all solutions of your uh, system. Okay. So you have here rho minus 1 half and rho plus. And then you, you will have, uh, let's say, phi 1, phi 2, up to phi m which are the periodic solutions uh, of your system. Okay. And these are all solutions. So Matano proved that uh, as time goes to infinity, any, starting from any initial density profile, you converge to one of these solutions. And using that result, you can prove that your stationary state is concentrated in a neighborhood of all these classical solutions. So if you take uh, all these solutions, you take a small neighborhood around these solutions, you can prove that your stationary state is concentrated on um, these solutions. But this is, of course, unsatisfactory because it's clear that the stationary solution will not put any mass on these unstable states. So the problem here is to show that the stationary measure is in fact concentrated on the um, global minima of your of your potential. Okay. I, I think what are the three periodic solutions? Are periodic solutions of of, so, of this equation. So you see the constant. If you take any root uh, of v prime, this is a solution. If you take a constant, but you have also periodic solutions. for this equation. There are exactly. There are finitely many. In fact, there are 3 plus m, where m is, in this special case, in the Chaffee infant equation, there are m plus 3 solutions. So there are m periodic and 3 constant solutions. And these are all solutions. Okay. And so by using this result of Matano, which tells you that uh, starting from any profile, you converge to one of these solutions. You can show that the stationary state is concentrated in the neighborhood of one of these solutions. But it's clear that the stationary state cannot give any weight to an unstable stationary solution. And this is, what, uh, this is our problem, to show that, in fact, this measure, the stationary measure, it's concentrated in the global minima of the potential. So this is the problem we want to solve. And for that, we will adopt, we, we adopted a um, dynamical approach. Because we, we have no information about the stationary state. So we'll try to use the dynamics in order to get some information about uh, the stationary state. So what we can prove um, it's a, what we call a large deviation result, saying that, well, we can show the existence of a function w, which is defined on over all density profiles, which has uh, the following property. So we, we show that if you take the stationary state and if you take a neighborhood, epsilon neighborhood, of the set of stable solution, so that this is essentially one. So if I take a density profile gamma, so gamma is a density profile. It's a function from the torus 
to 0, 1. And if I ask you, well, what is the probability that your density profile will be close to gamma? Well, if gamma is different or does not belong to the set of stable solution, you know that this goes to 0. Right? Well, what we can prove is that, in fact, this is exponentially small. And we can compute the cost function. So what is the cost to observe the density profile gamma? Okay. So we are saying that it's um, exponentially small. And we are giving exactly uh, what the cost is. So this is what uh, this result is telling you. Is that, well, uh, the cost of observing some density profile theta, it's exponential minus n w theta. So before, uh, so this we can prove. Uh, if I have time, I will explain you how we prove that. But let me go back to the um, example to see what does it tell us about the uh, stationary measure mu. So we'll show that uh, W is a very nice function. It's bounded, it's low semi-continuous, it has compact level sets. But in order to show that you in fact, concentrating at the global minimum, let me recall you what an heteroclinic orbit is. So I'll say that uh, a path rho theta, it's an heteroclinic orbit from a stationary solution phi to a stationary solution psi. If as t goes to infinity, rho t converges to psi. As t goes to minus infinity, rho t converges to phi. And if rho t solution of the reaction diffusion equation. Okay. So this is uh, what's called the heteroclinic orbit. So are all those paths which join two different stationary states following the uh, reaction diffusion equation, following the PD. And what uh, Fiedler and Russia proved is that in this example, here are the, um, all the heteroclinic orbit. So from one half, there exists an heteroclinic orbit from one half to rho minus and from one half to rho plus, and one from one half to rho phi m, phi m, and to phi 1. So in some sense, there is an heteroclinic orbit from one half to any other stationary state solution, which means that one half is the most unstable of all uh, stationary solutions, because you can find, uh, if you fix any of these stationary solutions, you can find very close to one half a point or density profile in which, if you follow the uh, PD, you go to uh, this stationary solution. Okay. And not only that, for from phi one you can, from phi m you can go to rho plus and rho minus, and to any other with a smaller number of uh, orbits. And similarly, you, from you always go down, and you go to rho plus and rho minus. And finally, from phi 1, you can only go from rho minus and to rho plus. So these are the entire description, a global description of the heteroclinic orbits in the case of the chaffin fend equation. So by using uh, this description of the heteroclinic orbit, now you can prove, you can deduce that indeed your stationary state is concentrated on a uh, neighborhood of rho plus and rho minus. So you can exclude from that that uh, the stationary state puts weights on um, on the other state. So more precisely, if you take any delta positive, you take a neighborhood of these two uh, constant density profiles, you can show that your stationary state puts uh, an exponentially small weight outside these two uh, neighborhoods. And this is uh, what we are trying to do. So in the last, uh, I think I have still five minutes, right? Yes. So in the last five minutes, let me try um, to explain how we do that, because, well, 
it's more an analytical problem than a uh, problem in uh, probability. So what I explain is that you can first describe what is the typical trajectory. So if you start from any uh, density profile at time zero, you let your process evolve, you can show that in any fixed time interval, you'll be very close to the solution of the reaction diffusion equation. Okay? And here, uh, as we ask what is the cost of observing a different density profile, you can do the same thing in dynamics. So let's take another trajectory U in this same time interval, and you can ask, well, what is the cost of following this trajectory U instead of the typical trajectory which is given by uh, the solution of this PD? And we can show um, that this, the cost is exponentially small, and we can compute what is um, what we'll call the large deviation rate function, which gives you, in fact, uh, the cost of following this trajectory u. This is it. So what, uh, what you're saying is that you have to follow the reaction diffusion equation. So maybe you want to follow something else. So let's say that we, we have a bump. So here's your density profile in, on the torus. And let's say that you want to move your density profile to the right. So there are two ways in which you can move this profile. One of them is that, well, instead of making the particles exchanging uh, particles, you can introduce, let's say, uh, a field. And these particles will fill this um, field. And they, instead of trying to jump one half, one half, they will jump more to the right than to the left. And this field will be strong enough that your, uh, your bump will move to the right. So this is one possible way in which you can exchange, modify your dynamics in, for, in, f in such a way that to force this bump to move to the right. Another way in which you can do that is that instead of creating this field, you can use the other part of the dynamics, which creates and destroys particles, and start creating particles here on the right and destroying particles on the left, and the bump will move to the right. Okay. Now, each of these modification of the dynamics have a cost. Now you can optimize over all costs, and this is the equation which tells you how to optimize. Okay. So you have u it's given, it's your trajectory. You have to solve this equation, in H, finding this, this is, well, uh, you have here an elliptic part, you have here exponentials of H, you, have, you show that there exists a unique H will solve this equation, and you plug it here to get the cost of observing your uh, profile U, your trajectory U. So you see, if U is the solution of the PDE, which means that uh, DTU is equal to this black part, which means that you have here uh, zero, so this equation, to solve this equation means to solve this equation in red equal to zero. And the unique solution of this equation uh, with zero here is just h equal to zero. So if you plug here h equal to zero, this first part vanish, and this second part vanish too. So this tells you that the cost of u when u follows the partial differential equation is just zero, which is what you expect, okay? So this is uh, the cost in of observing a specific trajectory u. Now, in order to um, okay, so in order to obtain that function w, which is called the quasi-potential, what you need to do is the following. Well, let's take one stationary state rho bar. I want to join rho bar to one state gamma. So what I will do is, well, I'll consider a trajectory which starts from rho bar and goes to gamma. Let me call this trajectory u. What is the cost of this trajectory in time t? Well, it's given by this expression. So if I minimize that over all trajectories u, which at time 0 are at rho bar and which at time t are at gamma, this is the cost, the total cost, 
of joining rho bar to gamma in this time interval. And if I now minimize that over all time t, this is the minimal cost in going from gamma to, uh, from rho bar to gamma. So let me call that V gamma rho bar. And this is what's called the quasi-potential. So now you do that for all. So here I wrote rho bar 1, rho bar m for all uh, station solutions. You define this quasi-potential for each of these station solutions. And from that, uh, you construct your function w. So there is a, um, a combinatorial argument in order to go from this function v to the function w. Let me just say that if there is only one station solution, v and w coincide. Okay. So this is a way in which you can go from uh, a process in which you know how it evolves in time and to obtain information from of the stationary state from this uh, dynamical part. So assume that you can prove a large deviation result of this type. So can assume that you can compute the cost of a trajectory. By computing the cost of this trajectory and by minimizing over all trajectories, you recover a functional, which is the quasi potential, which provides you the large deviation rate functions of the stationary state, which is written here. Okay. And this is uh, a method which has been used in order to um, investigate, for instance, um, non-equilibrium thermodynamics, which uh, has been an important subject in uh, mathematical physics in the last uh, 10 years. And this is essentially the method which we used in order to obtain information on um, non-equilibrium fluctuations. Okay, so I think uh, I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Yeah. Yes. Which is the physical relevant one. It's uh, actually, can we interpret that as something like actually minimizing? Yes, exactly. Or entropy, and can we do something like yeah, yeah, here you have an action. Yeah, that's exactly what we do. Yeah, so here is an action, okay. and what you're doing, you, you are minimizing this action. Yeah. Exactly. Really exactly. This is what you're doing. Okay. Thank you.